Hey folks, welcome to another Broken Meeple review and today I'm taking a look at Vindication. This is a new Kickstarter that I uh, just like got in the post like literally what like a couple of weeks ago and I've been uh, playing the death out of it in order to get it up for a review. I'm not going to keep the box on screen for too long because it's um, quite a big lid <laughs> so it's going to take up most of the screen you know and it's a uh, hello this video is about me okay but <laughs> Yeah, you know, certainly it's a big project. It's a big box, a pretty big Euro game. But what is Vindication? What's the big deal with it? Well, that's the hard part actually, trying to describe this game. Essentially, it's kind of like a sandbox Euro with some theme attached to it and some puzzle elements. It's, it is very difficult to describe this game. The idea is, is that the core concept is that you are all guilt-ridden scumbags. You know, you are thrown off your ship for treachery. And for some reason, there's a lot of ships that are throwing people off for treachery lately, but oh well, whatever. And you've all washed up on the shores. And now this is kind of like your redemption story. You know, what are you going to do to redeem yourself? And what you'll do is that you'll go off, you know, you start with one companion card and you'll go off into this map area as regions come out with different special abilities and you'll collect cards of varying different types, you know, relic cards, which are cool items, uh, you'll kill monster cards, you'll get trait cards, which are kind of like, you know, personality traits and, uh, you know, special effects, you'll get different companions of three different colours, you can throw in some little expansions and get stuff like pets and secret quests. There's a lot you can do in this game and lots of stuff gets you points or honor in this circumstance. But what you're doing is you visit these locations, you trigger their effects, you grab these cards, you can trigger their effects, but you're also manipulating this little puzzle in front of you, which is a board filled with, with cubes in three different spheres. And one sphere is useless, one is your bread and butter for currency effectively, and one is more powerful but situational effects. And these cubes can go from one sphere to another with various location and card effects, but you're juggling it around because you need those cubes in order to represent your attributes on the table as well as other things. Attributes being simple ones like knowledge, inspiration, and strength, as well as heroic ones, which are a bit harder to get hold of. You have to combine cubes in order to get them. Stuff like courage and wisdom and vision, apparently, is, a tr is a, an attribute, but oh uh, well. But... You know, you can do whatever you like in this game. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to upgrade your mount for speed? Oh, I could do. Are you going to vindicate yourself? You know, you're a guilt-ridden scumbag to begin with. Do you want to be a respected human being? Well, I could aim for that. You know, do you want to get loads of companions? Yeah, I'll have my uh, my my posse in front of me. Would you like a pet? Ooh, pets are pretty cool. Oh, there's that monster over there. And then game bonus. Yeah, I might go kill him. Uh, you know what? That trait ability is pretty good. I might grab that. And oh, that's a funky item over there. You get the gist. This is very much play how you want to play it. But the main goal is getting the honor. You have to go through all these different um, like locations and effects, generate as much honor as you can, be it during the game or end game scoring. And the game will end based on a number of triggers. There are two at the start of the game, and as you level up through the victory point track, effectively, honor, you unlock more end game triggers. So it doesn't necessarily accelerate the game, it's more that it gives another way for it to end. Everybody is aware of what these triggers are, and so it's variable as to when it ends, and I'll get onto more of that in detail later. But for now, I'm gonna shove this box down because uh, it's taking up a lot of room. There, down you go. But this was a pretty hefty Kickstarter. I mean, it funded really well. Tom Battle raved about it. But apart from that, I didn't see much other buzz about it. But the idea of a sandbox Euro game really appealed to me. So I thought, okay, I'll grab this Kickstarter. And yes, just the fact that I spent my own money on this does not influence my vote on this game any way, any way or another, okay? It's like, this is purely an objective review. And from what I can tell from the Kickstarter campaign, aside from maybe like a little promo pack and a miniature that's not really that needed anyway, all the content that I've played and reviewed is available in the normal edition. Although to be fair, the only way you can get this game, I believe is possibly direct off the website and on Kickstarter. But I hear they are gonna do a retail like sell at some point with some limited copies. But I don't know how the easier way to say this. I mean, there's one big negative that, like hovers over this game and it's a huge negative one that it is so bad I, I'm just gonna have to come out and say it I so wish that this game I wish I'd played this game before I did my top 10 of 2018 holy smokes I love this game <laughs> 
Oh my god. It, this one, I didn't know what to kind of expect. I thought, okay, the theme is kind of, you have to insert it in yourself. I mean, yeah, you grab companions and they all have different names and, you know, you can have a pet, you can go kill creatures, you tell your own story. But it's a bit like the pursuit of happiness, you know. You take a car to grow a bonsai tree in it. You don't feel like you're growing a bonsai tree, but you tell your story of your life. Here, you tell your redemption story however you like. But, oh my god, I am slightly addicted to this game. I am not gonna lie. You're not sleeping with it, are you, right? You know, the... I mean, for starters, component-wise, gorgeous production. I mean, absolutely gorgeous. I mean, this is just a little help sheet, but you get a lot of stuff in this box. You do get some miniatures, which granted, that's kind of a weak link for this because you don't use them that often, and even then, I don't know if I'll use them much again. But what you do get, some bags filled with these chunky hex tiles, game trays to hold all the components, and these are great game trays. Anytime you see a game with game trays put in them, you know that the publisher took effort with this. And each one of these little ones can hold all your player pieces without any trouble whatsoever. You've then got uh, the big game tray, you know, to hold various other components. Again, everything slots in really nicely, nice and easy to use. You have got a bucket load of cards. Yes, um, there is an insert for this game, and it's a decent insert, but I kind of preferred to bag it up my own way, and so I took the insert out. You know, sacrilege, <gasps> but never mind. You know, you can get square sleeves for these, so I have sleeved all these cards, but you've got a nice selection there, and that's not even the more. There's more in this box. You've got uh, the various sideboards, so uh, grab a few just to show if I can find one. Yep, the, uh, the power boards themselves, so three different spheres, the middle one being the good one, situational, and the useless one. You've got lots of rule books. You've got the giant board, which I'm not going to try and get out of this box. You've got expansion content as well because they threw in mini stretch threads. There's a lot of stuff in here. A lot of quality stuff. I mean, everything is, even though you've got black game trays and, you know, the front of your character is black, there's a lot of color here that's just striking on the table. All the decks are their own unique color and they're striking good colors. You know, a purple, a green, a red, a blue, a yellow, an orange. And when they're laid out in a big circle with all the region tiles coming out that match those colors as well, what starts off as a fairly muted, bland looking grayish brownie board suddenly becomes a thing of beauty and color. And color, oh my God, yes, lots of color. But all the other stuff in there, I mean, you've got metal coins for just representing when those endgame triggers come out. I mean, just something like a metal, you didn't need a metal coin, but they put it in here. The rule books, you know, they're very picturesque, uh, well laid out, and kudos, I will give this to Orange Nebula. This is one of the few rule books I see when, when a term is explained, it's put in parentheses what page to find the detailed rules on it. Why do more publishers not do this? It's a very useful thing to have. You read the turn sequence out and you go, okay, so you can move, activate, or visit. Uh, oh, visit is on page, tw you know, there you go. You can follow the book through. Now, in terms of learning the game, there's a reasonable amount you've got to absorb here because you've got the different cards that do different things and you've got a lot of different bonus actions you can do, which you're not gonna do every turn, but you kinda need to know how they work. The main turn sequence though is fairly straightforward. You have three actions, move, activate, and visit. You can do them in any order, but you must move and you must leave your current space and never return to it, at least not for that turn anyway. And you can, like I say, do them in any order. Those actions are pretty straightforward. Activate just means trigger a card or your character for some bonus attributes and effects. Uh, visit simply means go to a region and trigger its effect. You can rest as an alternative, which simply means manipulate your little board of cubes. And move is, well, move. What more do you need to say about move? So those three actions are actually pretty straightforward. It's more what you do with your cards and what you do with the bonus actions on top that really sort of cement your, your little point engine. And like I say, this game kind of feels like that. It's a thematic engine builder. You're trying to get your honor to, as high as you can above other players, but how you do it's up to you. You might have found a bunch of characters that allow you to kill monsters quickly and cheaply. Well, great, I'm gonna go on a massive killing monster spree then. You might have found a trait early on in the game that says whenever you convert cubes into different attributes and that, you get points. Well, okay, I better start focusing on attributes then. Maybe my secret quest that I have at the start of the game tells me, ooh, I get bonus points if I get lots of relics. Looks like I'm going after purple, so what do I need for that? I need uh, red and blue guys to convert into purple. Nicely done, and, and it's stuff like that that just 
hooks me into this game. It's a, it's not a brain burning puzzle, but it's a challenging one. It definitely makes you think you've got to plan ahead, but it's not going to melt your brain. You know, it's not like, I'd consider this mid-weight level. It's not a heavy game. It's certainly not light, but it's definitely situated quite nicely in the mid-weight category. Now, the, you know, the theme is kind of here or there. You're, I mean, I get a lot of theme out of this game, but that's kind of because I'm inserting it in. You know, you don't necessarily feel like you're killing a monster. You basically auto-kill it and then roll a die to see if your guy dies. You know, relics, you have a bunch in there in front of you. They have cool abilities. They feel a bit more thematic. A trait is basically just a special effect. And the companions, well, yeah, you might have this huge hulking dude, you know, like, walking around with you, but he gives you a special effect and some strength attribute. You know, it's not like it's, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I feel like I've got the, the Titan, the Incredible Hulk next to me in it. But... It gets people, if, you, if you're one of these people like me who gets immersed into the theme, no matter where it kind of is, then you're going to get a kick out of this because you're just going to tell your story as it goes. And sometimes you'll make decisions in the game which aren't exactly optimal, but you just want it. You just want to do it. You know, I'm, I'm on a mission thinking, right, I do need to get some of those blue proficiencies, those mastery tiles. I need to get a blue companion, okay? But there's a pink velociraptor pet over there. I want a pink velociraptor. <laughs> no, 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 I should focus on my goal. My blue goal is a, is a pink velociraptor. <laughs> it's like, it's stuff like that that just tempts you. So I say do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it. You can't do everything in the, well, actually, no, you can do everything in this game. I mean, you could grab something of every color if you really want, but it's more the fact that you want to do everything. Chances are you won't get a chance to, or chances are you shouldn't do everything. But then you get tempted, you just get thinking, oh, that's a cool character that's just appeared. Oh, well, that relic's pretty juicy. Hang on, I'm in the right place to go upgrade my mount. I could grab that monster there. There's a pink velociraptor. You know, there's a pink velociraptor, I'm not joking. But it's just so many temptations, so many cool little elements. And as I say, I get into the theme, I tell the story, and some people will do crazy things in the game just because they want to. You know, I play this with a couple of friends of mine who I have great times playing formatic games with, and I went on a massive monster killing spree. I mean, I was just literally like, right, I've got these guys and these guys. I am going to hunt down every monster ever. Luke, you're still a guilt-ridden scumbag, buddy, and you didn't vindicate yourself. Look, I'm, I'm a hero of the people, okay? I've killed every monster here. Do I see you going up against Drock the Unforgivable? It's like, no, you know, what are you doing all game? You know, sitting in your, in your tavern, you know, getting drunk. You know, that's not good. And a friend of mine, you know, says at the start of the game, is that after I've explained the rules, right, I don't care if I win or lose, I just want to ride Mothra. <laughs> because your mounts that you can upgrade, essentially you start off as a pedestrian, but then you can be a horse rider, and then, you know, the final one is Mothra, effectively. And the one in between is something that I think Jim Henson is going to sue Orange Nebula for, because it looks very disturbingly like the Land Striders out of Dark Crystal. Which, by the way, if you've not seen that series, watch it immediately, it's fantastic. Go turn off this video, go watch it, and then come back, all right? But, uh, I, I feel like I'm going on, I'm overheating like crazy, but the game just tr gets it out of me. And when I've played one game, I want to play it again. Very few Euro games make me want to play it twice in a row. I'm usually like, I've played it, I'm good. My brain's melted, or I've had my fun, I can put it away and try something else. This one though, I play it, I finish it, I immediately want to reset the game and go again. Euro games have a difficult time of doing that. And a lot of the time it's because they're too long, too mathy, not enough theme. This one throws in the right amount of theme, but with a cool puzzle to go with it and a ton of variety. I love variety in games. The replay value of this is off the charts. And that's the core game. You've got expansions on top as well, which I'll get onto in a minute. This is going to be a longer review, guys. I'm just warning you now if you haven't noticed the timer. But, oh my god, yes. So... No, I mean, like I say, I'm raving about it a lot. I do have to go into some negatives. You know, not no game is perfect. But, and one thing that I find it fine, I have no problem with this, but I can see this will irk some people. The idea of the variable end game triggers. You know, I like variable end game triggers because it means that the game will trigger at different times. You know, you might have a game that only lasts 45 minutes. You might have a game that lasts two hours, possibly even longer. Although to be fair, the longest I've ever played of this was two and a half hours and that was five of us. Four of us were new and I was kind of half drunk at the time. So, you know, we're talking like an hour to two hours to play this game. And that might irk some people because some people will play it and go, well, this is pretty cool. This is pretty cool. And then, like, oh, we finished? Oh, that was a little bit short for me. And then some people might expect it to be only an hour and then it goes on for two. It might be too long for them. The unpredictability of how long the game will last 
might irk you a little bit if you're that way inclined, so I'm warning you now. Personally, I quite like the idea that the game is a variable length. Sometimes I want to trigger the end really quick because I know that I'm in a good position now. But sometimes I'm like, I could trigger the end by getting that sixth trait, but I'm not ready yet. I don't think I'm going to win on end game points. I need a bit more time. And there's a pink velociraptor. You know, I'm obsessed with the pink velociraptor. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the pets are weird. I mean, you've got pink velociraptor, you've got deers, you've got owls, there's a squirrel. It's like, seriously? You know, there's all sorts of weird sort of pets in there. But again, it's all temptations. I mean, I've played six games of this. Uh, well, actually, no, seven or eight games of this, actually. And I've probably only uh, taken a couple of pets, you know, in all those games. But they're there. And it's like, oh, I really want one, but do I want one now? I don't know. <laughs> it's oh, so enticing. But like I say, variable end game trigger might irk you a little bit. Another thing that might irk you is the... There's not a huge amount of luck in the game. I mean, for the most part, what you see on the table is what you kind of get. But the cards are, there's a face up one and there's a, you can top deck. Now you can mitigate the luck by spending a conviction cube, you know, one of the, um, you know, situational powerful ones. And it allows you to do an empowered draw, which means you look at the top three and the face up, pick one and shuffle the rest back. So you get to mitigate the luck a little bit. But obviously, with luck of the draw, you are occasionally going to have that person who, like, a card comes out and it's like, oh, that's exactly what I need. I'm going to gun for it. Of course, you might take it before they do. I mean, why not? But, yeah, I don't think this game is full of a great deal of luck. But there's a little bit. A little bit with the cards. There's a couple of dice you roll occasionally with monsters or gaming attributes. But, again, for a euro of this kind of nature with a ton of cards... The luck is actually, I think, kept at a pretty good middle level, you know, where it's not stupidly lucky, but I think that the better player will win in all these games. I don't think there is a situation where, you know, oh yeah, the, you know, the, the newbie won by miles because he just got that lucky combo. No, I think they had to work at that combo. You know, this is one where I think if you're the new person, you're going to get trounced, you know, unless you're used to this sort of game. But, you know, that might irk a little people one way or another. There you go, I'll put it on the screen for you so you're not just looking at a blank, you know, just me all day. But let's get on to the expansions. Now, I'm not talking about Leaders and Alliances, alright? That will be a separate anthology review. And in Leaders and Alliances, you've got the Leaders expansion, a few little component changes, and solo adventures. Now, I have played the solo adventures, and so far, really liking them. But again, I'll touch on that more in an anthology. But at least you know that if you want to play this game solo, there is a way to do it, but it's going to require you to get the expansion. The main expansions that you have in the core set are two relatively big ones and a bunch of little mini ones. The mini ones are different location tiles. You've already got a bag of, you know, like plenty of tiles to fill the entire map. But then you also have a few little extras and you can basically interchange these. The rule book clearly says which ones you need to interchange based on how many you take, gives you rules on how each one works, and I've certainly cherry-picked my favorites that I like to throw in every game and some that I throw in situational games. There's, I think, uh, six of them. I could be wrong. We'll see. But, you know, these are very good additions, you know, because it helps to keep the variety. It keeps games different. You've got the pet menagerie, because that's technically not in the core game. I throw that into every single game because pets, come on, pink velociraptor. Um, there's a well of wishes I really like, which is where you have three different attribute bonuses or honor bonuses on this tile. And as you visit it, you take one, get the bonus, and then another one comes out to replace it, which could be different. So you've got this like a bonus tile with lots of little different bonuses throughout the game. It's quite a neat little thing and it's an easy include. The jewel crafter, I'm not a big fan of. I think it's too fiddly, it's unnecessary. It's quite a big swap to put it in the game. So I tend to not use it as much. Uh, the two teleporting tiles, I think they're shrine stones or something, um, they're okay, I can take it or leave it, I throw them in every now and again but not in every game, they're basically just two tiles that you can teleport between so it helps a bit with mobility. Uh, the construction tiles are pretty neat, you have construction tiles which have got nothing on them to begin with but then you lay out some other tiles face up and then if you visit a construction site you get to pick what gets built there as well as control it. So it's kind of like a two for one action but it's neat that you can sort of go all right, well, hang on, I could do with that building next to me, actually. So I'm going to visit there and I'm going to put it next to me where I need it. And the Secret Quest one, not as big a fan of, really. The, I mean, it's okay, I throw it in now and again, but it creates an issue that uh, some people who play Takinoko might recognize. Basically, it allows you to draw another Secret Quest out of the deck. Well, 
if you do that, you end up with the Takinoko basic game problem where you might draw the secret quest and it's like, oh good, I've just awarded myself seven points because I happen to have the criteria met. But then you might draw, like, you draw two and look at one, but then you might draw two and it's like, I have no chance of getting these. I can't get this mastery tile and there is no way I'm going to kill three monsters by the end of the game. So that was completely useless. It's a bit too swinny, a bit too lucky, not a fan of it, so I don't tend to include it. So leave that and the jewel crafter aside. I sometimes throw in the teleporting stones and sometimes the construction sites. I always throw in the Well of Wishes and the uh, Pet Menagerie though. Those two are really cool. And they don't replace much out of the core set. In fact, they probably replace the only boring building out of the core set, the Academy. So fine, good riddance. But yeah, you know, it's an easy include and I throw them in. The two other bigger expansions are Myths and Wonders and Guilds and Monuments. One of these I really like, one of these I really don't. Yeah, the one I really like, Myths and Wonders. Myths and Wonders has, it doesn't change the game dramatically, but what it does is that it throws in another thematic story element. A bit like what Empires of the Void does with those, um, uh, what are they called, the uh, event cards that come out, where suddenly like this planet is now under attack by alien invaders and that. Well, this one is similar, except what happens is that this giant beast thing is in the middle of the board with some cubes around it. And yeah, it has to be represented with cubes, but oh well. And the idea is, is that as you go near it, you basically provoke it. It's like, oh, don't tempt the beast, don't tempt the big beast. But eventually you are going to provoke it, it's going to awaken. But when it does, you essentially have this kind of, I'm trying to find the uh, board itself, this kind of separate mini game, you know, done for a player counts where everybody collaborates together to kill the beast. You contribute, att you contribute attributes that you have, as well as champions, you know, from your companions and that, and you put them on the spaces, depending on what color they are, and you get the little bonus on there. If you can fill them all, the creature dies, some loot cards come out that you share among all the players, which are a bit like relics, but have different requirements and that, you know, so some cool items happen, and then the game continues on as normal. It doesn't fundamentally alter the game. The rules don't dramatically change. You just have this added thing that you need to bear in mind with the center of the board, and then this cool mini game, which, you know, it stops the game dead and focuses on this, and then when this is done, you carry on as normal. It's, it adds a bit of length to the game because you kind of have to stop and do this bit, but it's neat. It's a nice little narrative, and it's a relatively easy include for someone who's already played the game before. Don't throw it in your first game. Oh, God, no. But it also does allow you to use a certain miniature, which I wonder if he's... Well, I'm not going to show it. You won't see it on the camera. But, yeah, this, this game came with miniatures to suit the various things. And they, like I say, they're situational. It wouldn't have bothered me if they had the miniature or not. But just when you got it, it's cool. It looks nice. And some other people might paint them. I won't, because I suck at painting. The one I don't like, though... Uh, the Guilds and Monuments, not a fan of this one at all, and I had high hopes for it. Firstly, because it uses a lot of cool miniatures where you actually have like this big monument piece in front of you that you can build. That's probably the best bit of the expansion, to be honest. The fact that you can contribute all these different attributes and elements a bit like with the, this, this like, mini game board and build your monument and it's this huge striking piece and you can put it on the board, put it in front of you, whatever, and it gets you points. There's other things this thing does though, and they're not good. Firstly, this is a hard one to teach without a cheat aid or something. You've got this little triangle token. It gives you a fourth action on the turn. And you can do up to like eight different things with this token. It's ridiculous. You choose one each round and you can't do the same one twice. But there's like eight different things to do with their own little fiddly rules. And this is where the rule book sort of falters a bit. I thought the rule book was pretty sweet throughout most of it. There's good pictorial examples, it's referenced where you got to look up stuff, you know, everything was in a decent section, the middle of the book is this huge index of every card so you can tell what everything's doing. I thought it was a phenomenally well done rule book for what kind of game this was. For some reason I feel like they were kind of on break when they wrote the Guilds and Monuments one because there's a lot of ambiguous stuff in that one. Unfortunately, this is kind of the risk with stretch goal expansions, which are thrown in just because the funding got too high. You know, I prefer it when expansions are, like take time to build and develop and then are released in a separate set, a bit like leaders and alliances. But when they're thrown in as a Kickstarter, as a stretch goal, I always get the feeling that they're not play tested fully and probably you know won't work as well. But they're hit and miss. I don't mind if they work or not really, because I'm more interested in the core set. Uh, but the problem with Guilds and Monuments, one, you gotta teach too many things. It's like, oh my god, all these different things. But what it does is that it can very often fundamentally break the game. Some combos and characters with that token become stupidly powerful, it's ridiculous. 
And what it tends to do is it takes the restraints off the board. Now I'm all up for having like, you know, not too many restraints, you know, don't punish me unnecessarily in games and that. But when I say take the restraints off, I mean that if you thought this game was fast, Guilds and Monuments basically cranks it up to hyperspeed, you know, ludicrous speed in fact. <laughs> hell was that? And it just fundamentally alters how the game plays. For starters, remember this board that I showed you? The, uh, uh where's the sphere board? It's quite a challenge to move your spheres around this thing, unless you've got the right combos to do it. You have to put in effort. The monastery region tile that you visit allows you to do it quicker, but you have to build up to visit that monastery. But you can put a triangle token on one of these bits and it automatically flips a cube over. That combined with some of the other effects you can do, like which make influence easier to get back in that, basically removes all the things that constrain you in the core game. Now I no longer need to worry about getting cubes from spheres to spheres. Well, why would I ever go to the monastery then? Now I can use this character pretty much indefinitely. Well, then I don't really need to worry about getting influence back then. It's like, you know, well, originally it was hard to get enough conviction to control loads of locations. Oh wait, everybody's got loads of conviction and now we're just controlling everything. It just, it takes the, imagine if you've got like a few cuffs on you, like a few handcuffs on while you're playing and they're not restrictive, but they at least stop you from going nuts. You know, this one basically goes, unlocks the cuffs and then everything just breaks. It's not, fun when that happens, especially when somebody just happens to get that overpowered combo, which you cannot stop just because the guild token allows it to happen. The whole building of the monument, which uses this board here, it's all well and good, but the problem is, is that you get points for it and you contribute like one of everything and a couple of proficiency tiles, but everything comes back to you when you've built it. You don't spend it. So there's no reason to build it in stages. Everybody just basically goes, I've got one of everything with two tiles and a conviction and I'm gonna build it and they just come back. It's very anticlimactic. And then once you've got the monument, it doesn't actually do anything. It's just 15 points and a cool miniature. So it's a bit of a letdown in that respect. Uh, but the main thing I don't like is just the fact that the whole ludicrous speed thing with this is just mad. Best metaphor I can think of, imagine, Think of those 90s uh, PC games you used to play. I used to play like Magic Carpet and Descent. Anybody remember those nostalgia? But I played those on an old PC when it was like tiny PCs and you had a uh, navigator and stuff as your home screen. And they were great games. I mean, you controlled, you zipped around, you shot fireballs and stuff and sent you shot like alien spaceships. It was great. Then you get into the 21st century and you get a modern PC and then you go, Oh yeah, I've still got that CD for uh, Magic Carpet in here. I'll just put that in. I said, oh, this should be a fun game. It's ridiculous. You know, it goes at hyperspeed because the PC is too powerful for the game you're playing. That's exactly what this expansion does. It basically takes the game that worked well beforehand, shoves it on a monster power PC, and then suddenly the game is going zippity doo dah around all the place and it just breaks or it's unplayable. It really isn't an expansion I recommend. Tom Vassell actually found it his favorite expansion before the Leaders and Alliances come out. I agree with him on a lot of things. This game for one, but I don't agree with him on that. I don't think the Guilds and Monuments expansion works. I mean, I'd love to hear your comments and your feedback if you've played this game, but personally, not a fan. You can skip it though. It was a stretch goal upgrade, whatever. So you don't get to use a few miniatures. Just put them on your wall, windowsill, whatever, and paint them to your heart's content. It's a striking box. I mean, the cover looks great. It's got presents on the table. Everything's well produced. The variety is off the scale with what you do in each game. The temptations are there. The point, ch the, the cube challenge is, you know, enticing. It's intriguing, but it like keeps you going without burning your brain, you know, and the, the paths you take to victory vary differently from game to game. Do I go heavy monster, heavy relic, a bit of everything? Did I find this combo that worked well one game, this combo that worked well another game? It's got a lot going for it. Tom Vassell loves this game a lot. I really love this game. I honestly really Really love it. I mean, yes, there's one or two mini expansions I won't use. The Stretch Gold Guilds and Monuments expansion, I will not use, but no game is perfect. 
The idea of my ratings and what, what I think about games is how much do I want to play them? How much do they give me something that is unique, something that is different from other games? Because this game definitely feels different from a lot of other games. It's, uh, it's hard to describe because I feel it is that different. You know, it's a sandbox Euro, which we've had one or two before, but that play out like this with the little puzzles and those cool formatic cards, no, I can't think of many games I would compare to this. It feels like its own kettle of fish. But oh my god, what steaming hot kettle it is. It's like, oh my god. So, I can't... What, what else can I say about this game? This easily, for me, this isn't just a, one of the best Euro games I've played this year. Uh, it, uh, it is one of my favourite games I have played. I really am somewhat addicted to this game because of its variety and how it looks and the fact that I can get into the theme as I do. This, I... I hate the fact that I couldn't play this. I, why didn't I get this on the first Kickstarter? Why did I have to wait for the second one? Because I could have had this in 2018 and it could have been on my top 10 of 2018 list. I am going to do a retrospective list though, so you will probably see it on there. But, oh my god. I'm so glad I can talk about it now though. This easily gets my full 10 out of 10 rating. I don't have an insignia or gold standard to shove on it. You know, I'll get one done soon. You can, Orange Nebula, you can take that insignia and you can shove it on the cover of your game in future prints if you like. Honestly, well done guys. You have created the game that just sings to me. You know, I mean, oh my god. If, if I'd made this from a top 100, this would have been a top 50 instantly. I dare say this would have been a top 20. This is really a game that I have just fallen in love with. It is not 100% perfect. There are small niggling flaws that people can come up with and certainly, like I say, there is one mini expansion I will never use, but there's another expansion that I can play, you know, so hopefully that's a good one as well that I can add to this. And all they need to do to expand this in the future and keep me happy is just give me more cards, more region tiles. I don't need new mechanics, I don't need new ways to play it, apart from the solo modes, they're pretty cool. But just give me more characters, more relics, more traits, make those card decks nice and big so you've got so much variety it's unreal, you know, that's all they need to do. And I'm sure they will. I'm sure that's hopefully on their minds, you know, wink wink nudge nudge orange nebula. But, uh, anyway, I better stop this now because this video has probably gone on for donkey's ages and I know what you guys are like with long reviews, but this is a big game to cover, there's a lot of content and I just had to get it off my plate because I've wanted to talk about this for a long time. Well, actually not that long. I've just been gagging to talk about it. That's really much the deal. You know, I've it's been a long time since I've got this passionate about a game and with a disappointing 2019 so far, it's refreshing to know that 2018 was actually a bit better than I thought it was now because this game existed then. So, vindication. That's it for me. I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple review. Will it be quite as happy as this one? I don't know, but, you know, it'd be nice because this is almost kind of euphoric, kind of therapeutic to have a game that I can just rave about rather than rant about. So take care. I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple review. And until then, regardless of whether you killed me monster, nicked me companion, blown me up with a relic, got Grok the Rambler after me, whatever, I could come up with a tw 20 different metaphors for this one. It's still, at the end of the day, only a game. But my God, is it a good one. Take care. See you next video.